Hello and welcome to season four, episode 40. That's wrong. Is that right? Shit. Sorry. Edit. It says, it says at the top, episode 40, right? I don't know if that's right. Let me look. It is right. I'm an idiot. All right. <laughs> I'm going to start again. All right, Matt, Eric, help. Just leave it in. Just leave it in. Don't leave that in. <laughs> Keep rolling. Keep rolling. <laughs> All right, here we go. The show must go on. Hello and welcome to season four, episode 40 of Undermine, brought to you by Osiris Media. I guess this is the episode where we're over the hill, 40. O to be young again, O to be 1.0 again. I'm Tom Marshall, your host, your guide, your time traveling show Sherpa as we revisit and relive Fall's famous, Fish's famous Fall 97 tour. That's the tour where Fish destroyed America. And we are diving into each show of that tour on the actual 25th anniversary of when it was played. So that is what we've been up to. Thank you for asking. And joining me on this journey is my frequent co-host, New York Times bestselling author and one-time roller coaster engineer, Benji Eisen. Hi, Tom. <laughs> hey, you talk about it all the time, Benji. Were you really a roller coaster engineer? <laughs> no. That was uh that was actually my first dream job until I found out that the math required was uh quite plentiful. So mm. I settled for co-host on Undermine instead, <laughs> uh, where I get to say things like this. If you've been enjoying talking our fish talk with us, then please consider joining Osiris Premium so that we can blaze onwards. You'll get bonus episodes of Undermine and HF Pod, add free episodes, access to the Under the Scales archives, meet and greets, AMAs, and even a chance to guest on one of our shows. So check out OsirisPod.com backslash premium, or to make it easy, just click on the link in the show notes. Um, you know, talking of show notes, here is the notes on this show. See what I did there? Um, it is now December 5th, 2022, sure, but also 1997, according to our DeLorean clock. That means that we are in Cleveland, Ohio. So as basic as bassist Derek Smalls would say, hello, Cleveland. Or look out, Cleveland. That's right. <laughs> and tonight, we're at a venue that neither Spinal Tap nor the band has played in. It is the CSU Convocation Center. Tom, do you know what convocation means? Um, on this night, it meant a very large gathering of fish fans. That is right. Fish heads, fish kids, us. And that includes our guest today, who I understand is someone that you might already know. Yes. And, you know, our normal tradition is to have our guest in the waiting room. And those of you who can see on YouTube, don't tell anyone who the guest is. Well, actually, maybe it's time for us to tell. Uh, most of our listeners know exactly who this person is. It's our CEO here at the Osiris campus. It's RJB. I'm going to bring him in from the waiting room. Click. Uh, but Benji, <laughs> there's one more thing you have to say, and it's going to make RJ super happy. Well, you know, we do want to make RJ very happy, super happy, as it were. So I am excited, actually, to hear his memories from this night. But look, we all have memories of these Fall 97 shows. You're hearing ours, and we want to hear yours. And we will, if you just simply make a one-minute video clip, share your story, tell your tale, take us back to Fall 97. If you post the video on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook, and tag Osiris Pod, you will automatically be entered into our fun little game in which a random storyteller will get the handwritten lyrics to Ghost, care of the song's lyricist, who also happens to be the charming middle-aged man that I'm looking at right now. It's Tom Marshall. Um, <laughs> thanks for writing those lyrics, Tom. You know, I have been stealing your lines since I was about 18. Well, now I, I, I get a chance to return the favor, I hope. Uh, <laughs> but without further fanfare, um, our guest has been very patient, waiting. Let's bring <laughs> him in, uh, the former and future Undermine co-host, RJB. Hi, RJ. How are you? <laughs> oh, man. This is quite a ride, guys. Is this how it always is? 
Yep, it's like a um, roller coaster with Benji always. <laughs> it's, it's, Come it's up like and just, some downs. <laughs> uh, I, I feel like I kind of missed. I was really like looking forward to finally seeing what it was like to be in the waiting room, and you know, I kind of like kind of got short shrifted. There must be something awesome back there that you guys don't want me to see. It's like being in Bed Bath and Beyond. <laughs> <laughs> It, the, I've, I've heard the waiting room and we've not been in there ourselves is phenomenal. Every single guest comes out there just ready to rock. So I'm sorry to deprive you of the waiting room. I'll survive probably. So RJ, you've been seeing fish, talking fish and podcasting fish for so long now. And by way of guest introduction, tell us when, why, and how you first got into talking about fish on fish podcasts oh man everyone who's who does this does such a good job of keeping it short which is hard um yeah i mean i so i saw my first show in the fall of 95 um at the palace of auburn hills the show that we'll be talking about or the no, that's that's not true at all we won't be talking about that show but um i saw my first show in the fall of 95 at the palace of auburn hills i've been collecting tapes for a while and you know, finally got to a show. I was 16 um, then, and I don't I don't know how my parents let me drive, you know, an hour and a half to go see fish when I was 16 with with a bunch of friends who were also 16. It sounds incredibly dangerous, but um, that that started it all. And this was my uh, this was this was my I don't know probably 10th or or so show um, between 95 and 97, and um, the beginning of a three night run: Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Cleveland, Detroit, Dayton. Um, I was a freshman in college at Ohio State. So like, you know, hitting Cleveland, Detroit and Dayton and then back to Columbus was like kind of a perfect, perfect circle. Um, so that, that's how that's how I ended up here on a Friday night. Triangle, actually. <laughs> yes. Right. Okay. RJ, uh, we're going to give you a hardball question off the bat. Was the famous Mockingbird real or a hoax? Uh, <laughs> never mind. Uh, I, we promised that we wouldn't get into politics here. So let's stick with fish. <laughs> Um, tell us about this venue and why you chose to see fish here. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, so they, they played here before. Um, and I, all I remember about it really was that we were, we were page side about like halfway up the, the first level. And, um, you know, we were, I guess at this point I was 18. So like, you know, I don't think we really knew what we were doing ever, you know, in, in general, but I think getting to Cleveland to get to the show, I remember it being, cold and and there was kind of a snowy weekend um and i feel like we almost missed the opener and we like walked into our seats right when the right when the opener started which you know these days like that's pretty rare that that happens um but you know i can't even i just can't even believe that we made it that's awesome um everyone keeps talking about this being cold and uh the weather now like 25 years to the day when this show happened isn't as cold as it was or I remember it being back then. I wonder what's happening if anything's happening that's t making the world warmer. But um, no politics, right? Uh, we've been remembering that back in 1997, uh, you couldn't just go to Live Fish to download the show from the night before. And in fact, it could take weeks or months before you get tapes from the show. And it was usually one at a time through the U.S. Postal Service. Did you get any fall 97 tapes before this night or was this show your first introduction to this tour yeah that's a good question um i think that i got the denver tapes i think i was starting to get them benji tell me if this sounds right i feel like i was getting them like two weeks after the show happened and i i think that we had the first fall tapes like on the on the way to this show and i don't think we had heard anything else we had heard summer and i'd been to some summer shows but this was like I was probably prepping for what Fall 95 sounded like on, or Fall 97 sounded like on the way to the show, which is, which is crazy, right? I mean, they're like, you've talked about this a bunch, Benji, where you can, you know, I can listen, I listened to the show that I went to last night, last night. I mean, it's not even the next day. Yeah. It's immediate, you know, <laughs> on the way home in the hotel room, you know, yeah. et cetera. Yeah. And we, we, we start to take that for granted. But at the time, we had to really work for it. I remember leaving shows in Fall 97 being like, I can't wait for two weeks from now when I can hear that again. Um, RJ, you know, people love to call Fall 97 the Cal Funk Tour. And I, I think that um, we sometimes focus too much on that aspect and we forget 
that in 1997, fish's hands were faster than guns. You know, in fact, that was actually one of the band's advertising slogans for the tour. Their hands are faster than guns. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this show starts off heavy on the Cal Funk, but it gets shreddier and shreddier, and then, you know, right through the Jimi Hendrix encore. So let's dive right into it. Set one opens with uh, with Ghost. Yeah, and you know this does it doesn't hit the depths of like the Denver version, but um, but it's a great opening. It kind of hits some of those same points, you know, where they start to start to the, get into the major key a little bit, but it doesn't go that far. Um, I remember as as Ghost before it goes into Wilson. I remember the the lights going down like almost completely or completely, and and all I could see was like a you know Trey had those candles on his uh on his amp and like that's all you could see down there was like candles and like this, you know, ambient kind of space at the end of ghost, which was really cool. But yeah, the, it's pretty upbeat, you know, and it's a, we talked um, a couple of weeks ago, like when you're in the Hampton Winston Salem portion of this tour, you're getting like, you know, only a few songs, right? Like this, this first set is very song heavy. Um, and I think there's, you know, that run the runaway gym in the, in kind of the, the middle of the set there, it's kind of the only notable part of the set when I went back. I mean, it's it's good and it's all like it, you know, it has that 97 sound. I don't know if you guys agree going back to it, but it was a little bit less thrilling than I remember it being in person. What about the Black Eyed Katie? I mean, uh, two songs later, sort of a nonstop segment of Ghost, Wilson, Funky Bitch, and 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 it's a phenomenal Black Eyed Katie and uh probably underrated. Uh, anything, yeah. yeah. Anything else from that first set uh, that's worth mentioning? I guess it didn't make that much of an impression on you. No, I mean, I just, I rem- I mean, we just, we were having so much fun, you know. And I, I remember, like, I had brought some friends with me who weren't weren't huge fish fans, and I think it was a couple people's first show. And you know, it just when I think back on the night, like, I remember just being so happy to be at a fish show in in the fall, like. And part of it, and I was going to ask you guys about this because uh, it was it was a sort of coming of age time for me, and and you know I was a freshman in college and I was out on my own for the first time, and and that overlapping with these shows, these handful of shows, five or six shows that I saw this tour, it it's it's hard to separate that from like this this feeling of freedom um, as a as an individual. But you guys were both in different. You, neither of you were freshmen in college at that time. I like Benji, do you, is this a coming of age tour for you or is it just a really good tour that is part of, you know, a longer journey? Well, RJ, it's, it's interesting because it is, my experience is kind of tied into what you're talking about. Cause that to me was December 95, which is, you know, one of my all time favorite fi- months of fish. Um, and is so remarkably different than this tour. Uh, that was when I was doing um, my, I was doing the finals, you know, uh, and for 97, I, I had just graduated. I was I was trying to figure out what I was actually, you know what? I hadn't fully graduated. I put my college career on hold and and I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And in between figuring it out, I knew I wanted to be on fish tour, you know, or, or see see fish as often as I could. I, I saw them nine times on, on this tour in between figuring out what I wanted to do with my life. And, uh, you know, Fish was hugely influential in that and in that you, you'd go to these shows and and you would feel this sort of endless possibility. You know, and I think that's the freedom that you're talking about. I, I felt the same kind of freedom like Fish in, in back in those days. I honestly had two lives. I had the now father of uh, two, I guess a one and a four year old in 97, late 97. Um and uh and, and a work a career uh my wife at the time who's now a huge fish head wasn't a fish head um but probably not because she didn't want to be probably just because she was a mom of young kids and and i was the one that was working right working at by going to fish tour and that was like my my freedom so any chance i got i would go on tour and i honestly i wasn't really thinking now i'm on fall 97 tour i was just like now i'm on the bus again huh. yeah, that's well, awesome fellas it is uh it's time for us to ring the bell of course <laughs> there is no bell 
What do you want to bet that we would have? Uh, RJ, maybe for the next season five, maybe we can afford a, a, a put in the budget for, for a bell right here. Uh, the bell would mean that it's set right. So we will be back in exactly 15 seconds. Have you ever wondered what it would feel like if your investments reflected what matters most to you? At Green Future Wealth Management, the advisors specialize in helping clients manifest their values in their financial lives. Green Future Wealth Management was founded by certified financial planner practitioner and longtime fan Nick Cantrell, named by Forbes as one of the top next-gen wealth advisors in the country. Whether you are just getting started or have complex investing and financial planning needs, visit them on the web at greenfuturewealth.com. You can sign up for the email list or take the investing values quiz. When you feel ready, schedule a free virtual consultation. In appreciation for the amazing fish community and the incredible work being done by fans across the country, Green Future Wealth Management will be donating 10% of asset management proceeds from new Osiris listener clients to fans for racial equity. Just be sure to mention Osiris when booking your appointment. Create your green future. Securities offered through Cambridge Investment Research, Inc., member FINRA slash SIPC. Advisory services offered through Cambridge Investment Research Advisors, Inc. Cambridge and Green Future Wealth are not affiliated. And we are back. We've got the whole team here. As I'm sitting here with Benji and RJ is in the hot, RJ's in the hot seat actually right now. And I wanted to point out something. Um, guns aren't fast, you guys. Bullets are fast. Guns are not. And uh, they had to fire the fish uh, person who came up with that slogan right after this tour. Um, but anyway, RJ, set two. Let's get to it. Second set opens with Stash. Uh, was Stash one of the songs of of this tour in your mind? Yeah, I think so. I think because it got it got out there, you know, and it was one of these one of the songs of the tour that I guess bucked the the trend of the cow funk. You know, it kind of like it it mm. was the it was like the counterpoint to the to the funk. Like it 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 made you know the this is like a classic tension release. I mean this whole thing is just amazing. And it, and I, I don't know how many times I've said this this season about these fall 97 shows, but that's one of the most notable things to me is like that this really does kind of like, it's almost more about these like intense jams than it is about the funk when you go back to it. And this stash is, is a great, great example of it. Yeah, and I, I agree. Looking back and, and re-listening to this tour, it's, it's uh, the shreddy songs too, in which, you know, we put the cow funk label, the groove label on the tour, but then you go back and that was just one element of, of it. You know, there they had all the other fish elements, a part of it. And of course, fans uh, were freaking out on, I mean, they fans are always freaking out, but they are freaking out on the 2021 summer tour, the beginning of Fish 4.0, because on any given night, uh, there is this idea and this, uh, you know, expectation almost that any given song could get the extended type type two treatment and be you know go go long, um, but that was also the case all these years earlier in 1997. There was you know the ACDC bag from Hampton, of course the the famous Runaway Jim from Worcester, and then this Julius it doesn't quite have the same notoriety, but it does go type two and goes out there. So so tell us about it. Oh man, I don't even know where to start really. Um, it's interesting that the the Julius like the the lyrics and the song part you you get what you what you typically get which is like fishman yelling and kind of like you know keeping the jam going and then it just kind of it takes off and there doesn't seem to be any slowing down or like you know what we're used to now especially with songs that don't get jammed out that much when they do it's like there's like a slow down thing and then it's like and then it kind of takes off again, you know, or or they like decide to take it in a direction. This just feels like it's just straightforward. I mean, 17 minutes is is quite a long time. And I, I didn't even I didn't even like really remember that it went into like, you know, there's some funky aspects, but there's also just like it's just it's like truly exploratory. You know, that, that's what it feels like to me. Like it doesn't follow a specific path. It's like they're they're going in and out of a bunch of different styles and um it's pretty amazing um just given the the tour that like julius is a song that just ended up being jammed out a couple times um i don't know it it, it was it kind of blew me away listening to it listening to it today 
I know what you mean about that. Like that slow down point is kind of like the part where they're all looking at each other and listening, like, where's this going to go? They're kind of like the audience at that moment. They're kind of listening, hoping a thread becomes something different, you know, becomes something amazing. Um, and it often does, especially in 1997, it sure did. Julius, in this case, uh, unfinished, uh, slave was unfinished. Did it feel like the ripcord was being pulled or or was it just that the band was shredding so hard they were flowing from one place to another? No, it was there. There, it just, it was just one long, one long piece of improv. I mean, I, the slave being like one of the only versions I can think of that goes in this dark direction. I mean, I don't know, Benji, like if, if you, if others come to mind, it's the only one that I can think of where it really like now, now they do that with hoods sometimes, but more like intentionally take it, you know, and then bring it back up. But this is just like it. I mean, I don't know. Like this feels like a totally unique version of the song and I'm not sure that it's appropriate to do with slave to the traffic light. <laughs> what do you think? Uh, I mean, I, I see what you're saying. I, I think it was, you know, they were very much caught up in the moment, and and uh, which is a good thing. What what we want. Um. So, RJ, I have a question for you that that is a, a question we've been asking a lot. But first, it occurs to me that a question that uh, we've never asked that has I don't think has ever been asked is, and that's for Tom. Tom, you know, going back to this, Julius. Julius, to me, is, I remember when I first heard, heard it, it was the day that Hoist came out. And I remember, you know, going into my dorm room and putting it on with my friends. And it is one of those songs that Fish does this really well with, with like Maze, for instance, where the lyrics and the music uh, seem very much matched up. Do you remember, did Julius, uh, when you went to Trey with with the lyrics, was, was, uh, did the lyrics come first or was it matched to the music? So I... I remember like all of a sudden it popped into my head, this incident. Um, so, so this one was completely written without me. So um, one of those where I gave him lyrics and, you know, with Trey, you never know, will those be, um, you know, turned into, you know, garbage? Will it be, you know, will it wrapping fish or something or, or instead will it be uh, lyrics or will he post it up on his dorm room, uh, door for for months like McGrupp. Uh, you never know when you send Trey lyrics if they'll ever even become a song. But this one, um, when I heard about it next, he had kind of come up with this amazing song, but it was strange because he called me and left me a message and I'm kind of glad I didn't answer because um, he had this choir there of... Um, uh, you know, they were they were black people, and he was asking uh, specifically if the word brother was referring to like the, the the guy was like, I'm not sure if we want to sing when you lay it on a brother. Um, and I didn't know, I don't know how I would have answered that to that guy at that moment because it was sort of one of those things. Just you know, I just sent it and forgot it. So if he had called me out on that right then, it would have been an unusual call for me to receive. But anyway, Trey was able to answer their concerns, um, obviously. But yeah, lyrics first, Trey did everything else after. And I missed a, a call that I'm glad that I missed from the studio. Well, it, it's the perfect marriage of, of music and lyrics and, and the lyrical context. Um, yeah, and Benji, I just want to say one more thing about the Julius. Just we talked to, I'd said like, you know, there's a lot of different things happening. And I, I will say that the first 12 minutes or so is just a straight ahead blues jam, you know? And they were just... Like they didn't really back off of that theme at all for for a long time, and I guess that's that's maybe what we would be used to at this point is the ten to ten to eleven minute really rock rocking Julius, um, and then there's just this extra five or six minutes, which is just wild that goes into this you know seventeen minute slave, which is just a uh, just crazy. But Benji, are you okay with them uh, messing with slave? I am okay with the messing with slave because I think that nothing is sacred, and I think uh, <laughs> it doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that it's going to be my favorite slave or that I'm going to think that it was a good idea. But I'm okay with them messing with it. Are you okay with them messing with Lawn Boy, Benji? Um, as a matter of fact, Tom, this is still Lawn Boy. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
It's sort of like Hood, I feel the same way about. Like the, the ones where they go into like the minor key and like kind of, you know, I I like the Hood's just like very, it's a serene and peaceful don't moment. mess with my bliss, dudes. Well, yeah, I, yes, exactly. See, the hood is the one where I would say that I do. In fall 95, there were there was a, a, a short-lived trend of them not finishing hoods, where there was this no, you can feel good about hood part. And I remember, of course, fish fans on the internet coming up with every conspiracy theory for every little thing they do, said maybe the band doesn't feel good about this tour. Maybe this is them giving us a message. You know, it didn't feel like that to me. It just felt like they were experimenting uh, by leaving the end off. Uh, and to me, that that always left me feeling a little incomplete. And so I remember in Worcester, 12 5, 95, there was a moment, it's one of my favorite moments of fish ever, because it sounds like they're not going to finish Hood. And I remember people around me being nervous, like they're not going to finish it, are they? Because, you know, we had heard about it on this tour. They weren't doing, they weren't finishing it. And then Tension all of a sudden, is high. Tension is yeah, high. All of a sudden, Trey looks up and you can see kind of the light bulb go off in his head. <laughs> and he like does like this. And with one little sweeping moment uh, movement of, the, of his guitar pick as he kind of scrapes the strings, the whole band just kind of slams back into it. And Corona lights up the stage again. and it, You can it, feel good. Yeah, and they just go right back. It, it, it sounded like a plane landing, and <laughs> like they weren't going to finish it. And then all of a sudden, going back into it uh, was the ultimate tension and release for, for me. Um, Amazing, because if they don't tell you that you can feel good about Hood, then you can't feel yeah, good about it. Hood. <laughs> that's it. Uh, and obviously you have to read a message into it that maybe they're not feeling good. You know? Yeah, right, exactly. Um, um, Tom, oh, sorry, Benji. I just uh, want to ask another question of Tom. Tom, they, they, the stash, uh, between Stash and Julius was bouncing around the room. I just want to know, like, you guys have, you and Trey have written a bunch of songs just even in the past few years. And I know that bouncing is, is or has been kind of at the top of your list of all the songs that you guys have written. And I was thinking about it today because I think it's a good, very short, you know, kind of landing after the stash and before the Julius. And it's a, it's a really nice version. Um, how do you feel about that song now? Like, is that still, is it still at the very top? Yeah, I, I forget. There was either we had heard a version of it or... We were together for some playing of it or, or replaying of it, and we kind of turned to each other and we both agreed. And th this could have been twenty years ago, um, could have been twenty five years ago, exactly. When um, we said we think bouncing's, we both agreed that bouncing was the best song that we'd ever written. And uh, I don't think we'd say that today. I mean, I think uh, in the very recent, very recently, Trey and I both uh, again were together and agree that leaves might be the best song we've ever written. But so it changes, it changes, you know, tide goes in, tide goes out, new songs come by and, and uh, we choose different favorites. But uh, at the moment I would say uh, bouncing probably isn't on my list of, of favorite fish songs that I've written. It's it's not on my list of favorite songs that I want to see them play live because they don't often do any improvisation with it or anything like that. But getting into Fish, I remember it was one of those songs that to me was the, it had that fingerprint of Fish that no other band could play the song. It was the and, quintessential Fish sound. It had the dink, 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 dink. Yeah. Dink, dink. It was upbeat, everything about it. It had sort of wacky lyrics, everything about it. And it really in intricate harmonies and and stuff. Yeah. And this very, is my first live version. This is the first time I saw it live. Very majestic too. It has a very majestic sound to it. Like like you are just waking up from sleep. You know, nice. um, RJ, you know, we've been asking this question a lot uh, on here for the fall 97 shows. Uh, there are some of these, you know, there's obviously the big ones like Hampton and Denver uh, and Albany. But then for a lot of these less obvious sleeper shows, where do you place this one within the context of fall 97? You know, that um, it's interesting because I was looking at the fishnet comments earlier. Um, do you guys know Wally? You know, Wally Holland, Wax Banks. You know, he wrote, I have the book here. He wrote a book on, on Fall 97. Um, and it's, it's great. And we, I talked to him about it a long time ago, but his review on this show on fishnet 
it's a two two step review. One is if you're going to skip one Fall ninety seven show, it can be this one, and then number two is don't skip any Fall ninety seven shows. <laughs> um, so I, I kind of agree with them. Like this, I feel like they're the the replay value is is really like the runaway gym in the first set, the Julius, the stash is really fun. Um, and then this kind of strange slave and the rest of it is fine, but it feels a little bit disjointed going back to it. You know, like it felt like there was a little bit of ups and downs in terms of the, the flow and, and kind of the execution, which I think is pretty rare in this tour. So, so I would put it like toward the, the, the bottom tier probably. And, and, and you may have just answered this, although, um, you know, conspiracy theories aside and the, the slightly disturbing slave to the traffic light aside, close your eyes and think of this night. Uh, does anything else come to mind? It could even be a story or something. Like you, you said, you were a college student getting your freedom. Yeah. You, you know, I I have no idea how we got home from Cleveland to Toledo, but I think that we got the home that night. It's a two hour drive. I have no recollection of it whatsoever. And I hope I wasn't driving. I don't think it's because I was on anything or I think I just, I just, I have, I have no recollection of, you know, a car full of 18 year olds getting, you know, driving two hours on the turnpike at whatever it was midnight. Um, And I'm just very thankful that everyone's still alive. What, 25 years later, you don't remember driving home? <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, right? I mean, I can you, barely remember not, what happened yesterday. But. How do you not remember that? Well, I, know. I, I think that's I think that's going to do it for us today. Benji, any other questions for our guest? Uh, who was the, what's the original cast of Leave it to Beaver? But uh, other than that, no, I, I think we're good. <laughs> wow. Wow. All right. Well, that's going to have to do it for us today. Um, and if you're watching on YouTube, you're looking at the face of Undermine. And uh, thanks to my fellow co-hosts and house guests, RJB and Benji Eisen. Thanks to the Osiris team that we have behind us, especially Eric Lomarenko and Matt Dwyer. And thank you for listening. By the way, if you need tickets for anything coming up, like say Fish's New Year's Eve run, then I'd encourage you to check out Cash or Trade, the world's only social network where fans buy, sell, and trade tickets at face value. Click on cashortrade.org and may the ticket gods be ever in your favor. And if you're playing along, we hope you're playing along, then go home tonight and queue up 12697 from the Palace in Auburn Hills, Michigan via Live Fish. Our special guest tomorrow plays bass in a band that you may have seen not too far from there. That's the only clue we'll give you until tomorrow. Good night, Cleveland. Good night, RJ, and good night, Benji. Good night. service.